you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Bell. Wow, please have your seats. If it was up to Kevin Kilonzi, this would just be a party until, until tomorrow. <laughs> wow. Great to see all of you. I can see you guys are still coming back in from tea. Let's just come in and uh, dive right in. Uh, I trust that Fearless has been good to you so far. And I pray that you've just, that God has just been speaking, doing His thing. Uh, like I said, right after this, we're going to do a commissioning, and we're going to have a time when we just uh, speak impartation, speak blessing uh, over every one of us as we go out to do the things that we've been commissioned to do. We've been looking at what it means to be a movement, the fact that we're all called to be part of movement, that this is how Christian gospel advances, that this is how... Uh, churches are renewed. This is how societies transform, nations are transformed. And today I want to give a, a, a talk that was actually meant to be given by Pastor Oscar, Bishop Oscar Murillo. And uh, he, he was meant to be the one kind of closing this out, but he had to travel. Uh, and then he invited, I mean, actually he didn't invite me, I was invited by Apmo. Uh, Apostle Mo had made an appointment with Bishop Oscar. And uh, then being the brother that he is, he wouldn't, let, he wouldn't go and enjoy meeting this guy by himself. So he called me and said, I'm meeting, my team and I are meeting Bishop Oscar. I'm just letting you know, so you know what to do. <laughs> so, so, so he didn't want to be the one inviting me. He's just like, you, you just need to know so you know what to do. So of course I called Bishop Oscar. I'm like, how are people coming from Uganda to sit at your feet and I'm not there with my team? And so he's like, okay, 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 okay. So, so my whole executive team joined the executive team of uh, Worship Harvest. And we had a glorious uh, three, three days. Tell you, it's good to have a brother. It's good to have people who look out for you. They don't just eat by themselves. They don't just enjoy by themselves. They look out for you and they don't leave you behind. So uh, thanks, Abmo, for that, uh, that privilege. And you know, it's interesting because when I went and when we went, uh, the things that Bishop Oscar was teaching were exactly what I'd asked him to speak about at Fearless. And so I thought, okay, this is a lot do downloading for me so I can teach. So everything I'm going to teach, uh, the good stuff is from Bishop Oscar. Anything bad is I, what I picked badly, like the stuff I didn't understand. So if you, don't, if you get something that doesn't come nicely, just know that was not Bishop Oscar, that was me. Uh, but all the good stuff comes from him. I want to talk about finishing well. Finishing well. And I'm going to talk about the qualities of a healthy movement leader. So that's what I want to talk about as we're concluding. You see, I think starting a movement is not an easy thing, but once you understand it, you can do it. You can do it. I think you're, all of you are getting the picture. You can do this, isn't it? You can do this. But finishing well is a different matter altogether. And that's why we want to talk about, uh, about this, because it, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's not many people who finish well. How do you ensure that the thing that God is birthing in you here at Fearless will actually have Jesus at the center. It will always continue to be a movement of the gospel. It will always continue to glorify Jesus and lift him up. How do you ensure that? Because we know many organizations, Apostle Moore talked about some of those organizations that began well. They started with Jesus at the center. And today, that's not what they're known from. We have, we have, we have universities that he talked about, Cambridge, Oxford. We put Yale big because we're taking it back, y'all. Uh, Harvard, Princeton. I mean, all these were not just started to serve God. They were started to train pastors. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, many of these were started to train pastors. Um, Harvard, the oldest university in the U.S., it's named after Pastor John Harvard. Pastor John Harvard. He's the one who it's named after. He donated his library and half his wealth to start the school. And basically, this school trained many Puritan ministers, which is what it was wanted to do in its day. Today, some of these places are the farthest place you want to declare that you're a Christian. I mean, you don't want to go in there and just shout you're a Christian. It's not the place you do that. But that's not, that's not what they were created for. How many of you have ever heard of the YMCA? Let me just see. Show of hands. Okay. All right. Uh-huh. That's so sad. That that's a song that comes to mind when you think about the YMCA. That song was actually popularized by the gay lobby that Pastor Curry was talking about. I don't know if you know that. 
And it was, if you watch the music video, it really is a popularization of the gay agenda. But the YMCA was founded by 18, in 1844 by George William to improve the spiritual conditions of young men in the city of London. A lot of rural young men were coming in to look for jobs in the city, and the city was not a good place for them. Uh, there was a lot of drinking, a lot of uh, brothels, just a lot of bad things going on. And the lot of young men, all these young guys who had come from shags to, to work in the big city was horrible. And this guy, he was a draper. He was, he was in the cloth industry, and he was a believer. He loved Jesus, and he said, there must be something someone can do about this. And he, he conceptualized this, this concept, uh, called some friends together, said, what if we start a place where we can do Bible studies and godly lectures for these young men? And it started, and it became so, so popular that it started to spread to other countries. And so they brought the countries together, the, the different wise together, and they, had, they created a mission statement. To, they said, to unite all young Christian males for the extension of the kingdom of God. Is that an amazing movement vision? Like getting all men together, all young men, Christian men, who are once lost, but now it's like let them extend the kingdom of God. This is what this thing was founded for. Today, if you search, you're going to find very interesting mission statements about YMCA. Uh, you're going to see something like the Y is committed to empowering people to reach their full potential, to improving well-being, inspiring action, strengthening communities, and ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to become healthier, more confident, connected, and secure. It's like, like what in the world is that? It's like someone said, the Young Men Christian Association has nothing to do with the young, with men, with Christians, or even with association. I mean, it's, it's it, none of those things that it was founded for. In fact, the, one of the most spiritual, the only spirit, spiritual thing you're going to find in many wise, as they call it, is a yoga class. And just for the sake of <laughs> today's spirit, spiritually not very literate generation, yoga is not a Christian practice. Okay, you see? That's why only the guys at the front say yes. Because many of you have come to believe it's a very neutral practice. I had a pastor from Asia come for fearless. He's one of the leading theologians. Uh, pastor Adrian, a uh, great man of God, uh, just a very respected theologian. I, asked, I told him, Pastor, a lot of young men in Kenya, uh, young men and women in Kenya are, are practicing yoga. What do you think about this? He looked at me and said, they are mad. He said, coming from my culture, where I know what those things mean, he says, that is crazy. Like, they don't understand what they're invoking over themselves. They don't understand the spiritual doorways that they're opening. But you see, these things have become so mainstream, they've come from the periphery into the mainstream and displaced the center. And now even Christians, even churches have yoga classes. Complete ignorance. What a shock. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so I'm just speaking to somebody in Mavuno who is a yoga... That's what you post on your Instagram, by the way your yoga class. And I want to tell you that this is actually not a Christian practice and that it opens spiritual doorways and that we've actually done deliverance classes here with people falling on the floor with demons. My wife can tell you. And the doorway that we discovered was meditation and yoga. Uh, that they opened up doorways to demons and they had no idea the oppression they were bringing into themselves and their families. Anyway, that's not what the sermon is about. <laughs> How will your movement finish well? And not just the movement, how will you finish well? How will you stay vibrant in your faith? How will you keep yourself from becoming arrogant and proud when things come and you succeed and God begins to use you? I mean, we know of many stories in recent times where there have been huge scandals in the church today, don't we? And I want to just, I mean, as I share this, I want to say it with humility and not with any, in any way to judge or condemn but there are many, many great men and women of God who've, who we've had scandals with. I mean, I put some of these people because they were my heroes. I mean, they're people that I've followed. Some, um, they're people I've followed. They're people whose books I've read. And I don't know if you recognize some of them. Tell those guys who are full of the Holy Spirit at the back there to just come in. We, holy laughter can happen in here also. So that's Bill Hybels. I mean, this guy has had a lot of influence on me as a Christian. He's one of the people who was a proponent of the megachurch, incredibly humble man of God. I mean, he's changed, changed hundreds of thousands of churches, literally, in the world. He was accused by several women of inappropriate relationships, 
and it led to a huge decline of his former church. It's a, it's a shell of what it, it, it was back in the day, just because of that. Brian Houston, how many of you know Brian? Very famous uh, man of God. Led him in Australia, resigned not long ago after a discovery he had sent inappropriate text messages to female staff, and that he spent time alone in a woman's hotel room. And the fall, fallout has been terrible. I mean, across the world, this is a vibrant movement of churches in his generation, just a gifted, gifted man who's given years to build this movement, and today it's, it's falling apart. Uh, Mark Driscoll, Mark Driscoll led a church called Mars Hill, and uh, again, extremely gifted young pastor, uh, was growing a church, it was growing the blazes, it was impacting, I mean, he has a church movement called Acts 29 Move uh, that, that helped many, many churches grow and really planted seeds of the gospel in places. He resigned after, uh, amidst charges of being called quick-tempered, domineering, and arrogant. And he, he, he was basically booted out of the church for that reason. Ravi Zacharias, at the top on your right. Uh, man, this guy was a big, big, big influence in my life. He, he uh, taught uh, how, uh, us how to defend our faith. He had such a confidence in the gospel spoke in colleges and universities across the world, are highly respected. After his death, it was discovered he had lived an, a, a double life and had several in, extremely inappropriate relationships of a sexual nature. And the great ministry that he had started across the globe is falling apart. It's falling apart. Now, the crazy thing for these leaders is that the, the ministry they labored for, the thing that God used them to start, the thing that actually changed many lives, that it came crashing down to almost, so that nothing is left. By the time you're gone, it's almost all fallen apart. How do we avoid going this same way? And you know, this conversation is very personal for me because, again, like I said, these are men that I've looked up to. And I believe that these are men who are close to God, who walked with Him. And I look at them and I say, if it happened to them, it can happen to me. I'm not, I'm not that spiritual. I'm not that holy. If it happened to them, it can happen to me. And it can, happen, it can happen to anybody in this room, isn't it? Every single one of us. It can happen to us. Matthew 6, 26 says, What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet for faith their soul? For faith their soul. What can you give in exchange for your soul? What can you give? There's nothing you can give. You, 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 you do all these things, and then at the end of the day, you lose it all. That's what we see with these men. And so, so the, 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 the word I wanted to share today was about the soils. There's a parable of the so soils. We call it the parable of the soil, isn't it? Uh, Matthew 13. But actually, it's really the parable of the soils. Because in the four soils, in the, in the, in the parable, the soil is the same in all four. Isn't it? The seed is the same in all four. The only thing that's different is the soil. The soil. So actually, this is a parable that describes the soils. So I believe if Jesus had a title for it, he'd have called it the story of the four soils. And it talks about, you've all read it, it talks about where the sower goes out to sow his seed. He's broadcasting it like they would back in the day. And as it's going, it's carried by the wind and it lands in different places, four different types of places. And there's four different reactions. And maybe we can put up the table uh, because I believe that that table kind of shows what happens. The first soil is the path. And remember what Jesus said, huh? He said it was eaten by birds. The path was hard. It's hard ground. So when the seed fell there, it was eaten by birds. And Jesus said, let me explain this to you. Later on, he calls his disciples and says, let me explain this to you, the ones who really want to know. So Jesus, by the way, didn't teach. He taught the crowds, but then he always moved a little farther in for the people who really wanted to know. He wouldn't waste time uh, instructing people who are not ready. And I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, it's a discipleship thing to learn there. Uh, so the people who hear without understanding, and the evil one snatches the word away from them. It's very possible that you're here at Fearless, and God has been speaking to you, but you're listening without understanding. And it could be that you're distracted. It could be that there are other things happening around you. Uh, it could be that there are things in your foundations that are keeping you from understanding. And what happens is the evil one snatches it away. Now, something very prophetic yesterday happened when Pastor Carol prayed for us in the morning. I didn't know what she was going to pray for, but she actually destroyed foundations. 
and she had uprooted foundations, evil foundations. Interestingly, Bishop Masika did exactly the same thing. And today, Pastor Milton did exactly the same thing. And it's like God is just in the process of softening the soil because they had foundations for some of us. I believe that because of some of those prayers, that, my goodness, this is not going to happen to some people here at Fearless. That they are not hard ground anymore. Their, their soil is not the path. That there's something soft in your heart. And God was preparing you for the messages that you're listening to. Now, for me, if we were to apply that to leaders and to leadership, movement leadership, we'd really be talking about a leader who failed to understand their kingdom calling. So you came, you listened to the word, you're excited about it, but you failed to understand the significance of what was shared here. And because of failing to understand, you listen to Jackie and you said, wow, the NGO sector is amazing, eh? Man, those guys, they really go through hard things. And you listen to Bishop and you're like, wow, the life of a bishop is tough, eh? Spiritual warfare. Wow, that was amazing. And you listen to the doctor and you're like, doctors, wow. And they're in politics. Hey! <laughs> what a shock. And, and you're listening and you're like, man, I'm shocked. And you are not understanding that everything here had to do with who? And so because of that, guess what happens? You left fearless. You're like, what a great fearless that was. Amazing fearless. Exciting, Exciting fearless. And guess what happened? It was stolen. It was stolen. It's very possible that you can come to fearless and leave and nothing happens. The movement was stolen before it began. It was aborted by the enemy before it was born. And somebody needs to say, that's not my portion. Yeah, that's not my portion. I can't be one of those people. I can't be one of those people. Jesus tells us there are people who are like this. That they, they, I mean, it, it comes, the, 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 ground, the ground was hard. They were thinking about other things and boom, it was stolen. Then he talks about the rocky ground. And there he said the seed sprang up fast, but it withered because of sh uh, the, the soil was shallow and there was no root. It was not able to dig deep. Uh, because of shallow soil. And basically, he explained to his disciples later, he said, there are those people who receive the word with joy, but when trouble and persecution comes, they fall away. When difficulties come, trouble comes, hardship comes, they end up falling away. And here's what it, it means for you as a leader, a movement leader. This is a kind of movement leader. Your ministry grows. You'll actually leave this place and you start stuff. It's like, my goodness, God spoke to me. I'm going to do it. I'm one of those people who's doing it. But guess what? Life happens. Something begins to happen. Challenges come. Tell your neighbor, challenges come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they come. Discouragement comes. Tell your neighbor, discouragement comes. Yeah, it comes. It comes. It comes. And, and you know what happens? If you don't understand this, because some people say, if God gave it to me, God will make it happen. That is not true. That is not true. And many Christians don't understand this because you've not developed a theology of suffering and a theology that things can actually be hard for me as I follow Jesus. You know, it's such a dangerous thing to have that when you don't understand this, I mean, I remember reading about, um, we're reading through the book of Acts with my disciples right now. And I mean, we're, I, mean I love the book of Acts. It's probably my favorite book in all of Scripture. And, and, and we're talking, I mean, I was just reading about Paul and how he goes to preach in a city. And when he's preaching the gospel, I mean, he's so excited about it. This is his first missionary journey. I'm like, I'm representing Jesus. I'm going international. My ministry is international. And then he preaches, and guys are excited. Uh, they even call him Hamas, one of the gods, you know, uh, because he's the one who speaks, and Hamas is the one who spoke. And then they call Barnabas Zeus. Barnabas is like the, the chief god because he's like the quiet guy behind Paul. And like this guy is Zeus. They even try to slaughter a cow for them. And it's like, they're like, no, we're just men. And they say, come on, don't, don't, don't do this. Don't worship God. And then they start to teach about Jesus. And some Jews come and cause problems in the crowd. And they take these same guys who they thought they were gods. Outside the city gate. Stone him. I don't know why they didn't stone Barnabas. It's Paul they stoned. I guess he was, a, he was a loud guy. The guy who talks is the guy who gets stoned. They stone him and they leave him for dead. By the way, do you know being left for dead means that they were really stoned? Like, I mean, he was bleeding. He was battered. He was bruised. You know, we read this stuff like, we, like, like you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not a video game. Like he lost one life. 
and it's <laughs> I still have five lives left. No, no, no. Reset. Press reset. It's not like that. I mean, this guy is in pain. He's been beaten up. He, he, he thought he was following Jesus. He's representing him. But guess what happened? This guy stoned him and left him for dead. What many of us, what would we do? Let's be honest. What's the thing you'd do if that happened to you? Go back fishing, somebody says. Yeah, go fishing. It's like, Lord, I didn't hear you. That can't have been the Lord. Go back to Antioch. Go back home. It's like, this, this was not the Lord. I mean, this, how could God do this? And I know Christians who've lost their faith when something like that happened. It's like, things, it was never meant to be. This is not what I signed up for. How could I preach Jesus and then I get, I get persecuted? How could I try things and then somebody, you know, I shared this about uh, William Curry and how he was the missionary who went to, I think I was talking to my pastors recently, and I said he was a missionary that God sent to bring the gospel uh, to India um, in, the eight, in, the, in the 19th century. And this guy, I mean, he preached the gospel, and because of him, India, I mean, the, the impact of this man is incredible. But you know, the crazy thing about George, uh, uh, about um, William, he lands in India, and he has uh, three of his children fall ill and die, like one after the other. Guys, we're not talking cartoons here, we're talking real life. One child, like losing one child is, it's mind-blowing. It's insane. It's, it's like crazy making. The next one dies. The next one dies. And his wife is so grief-stricken that she loses her mind. And she has to be locked up because she's, she just goes crazy. She, she's no longer sane. And they have to lock her up. And his companions, some of them quit on him because it's like, this is too hard. This cannot be God. I mean, how does God allow this to happen to people who are giving their lives for the gospel. This man did not go back home. In fact, he didn't go back home ever. For the next 41 years, he lived in India, gave his life to serving Jesus. And because of him, the Bible was translated. He personally, this guy was not even educated. He dropped out of school uh, at, at age 12. But he studied Greek and Hebrew, and he translated the, the gospel into six, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Bible into six different Indian languages. Uh, including Hindu and Gujarati and some of the big ones. Uh, he's a person, he started the first Indian newspaper. He's a person that started uh, mission schools in India. He started uni the, the first university that gave degrees in India. He started that. Uh, he's the first person who, st uh, he, he, who started the campaign. He, he, he won this campaign against widow burning. Uh, because at that point, if you died as an Indian woman, you would be basically burnt on the funeral pyre of your husband. It was just automatic. And he was like, no, this is not what the gospel says. And I don't care if it's culture. Culture there is wrong. And he stood against culture, and they banned that practice. And also infanticide. If people had, they didn't want girls, because girls meant you have to pay dowry, and you became poor. And so ki girls would be burnt, and uh, sorry, would be killed when they're born. He stood against that. And India will always honor him and recognize him because of those two practices in their law that were changed. But look at the cost. Look at the cost. You see, we see the glory, but not the cost. We look at this great person of God and look at how God is using him. But Jesus is asking, are you willing to drink this cup? Hey, listen, how many want to be movement leaders in the house? Amen. And Jesus' question is, are you willing to drink this cup? Because problems will come. Challenges will come. After fearless, they will come. And it's not, it's, not, it's not because God doesn't love you. It's just because that's the way the world is. Jesus said, John 16, 33, in this world, you will have troubles. And then he says, take heart, you'll never have troubles. No, he doesn't say that. He says, take heart because of what? I've overcome. So when troubles come, the thing that will encourage me is not that troubles are going away, but he has overcome. And because he has overcome, I will overcome. But in the meantime, I get to know God differently. You see, there are times I get to know God as my, 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 the one who leads me. I get to know God as my defender. I get to know God as the one who is the breakthrough God. But the other times, God wants me to know Him as my comforter. You know, you'll never know God as your comforter if you don't need to be comforted. 
Yeah, yeah. And some of us, when, when God wants to start revealing himself as comforter, we are out of the door. <laughs> we are out. So, so that's that movement. You saw that movement. Uh, the movement that was, that was uh, it, it stopped because of persecution. It stopped because of challenges. And I believe that's not your portion in Christ Jesus. That's not your portion in Christ Jesus. God, God is raising up an army here. He's raising up people who will stand up and say, I will follow Jesus. I am compelled by the love of Christ. I will keep going even if they stone me. This is the kind of faith that changes the world. That's the kind of faith that starts movements. The third seed fell on thorny ground. Thorny ground. And these are, Jesus says, these are the people who hear and they receive it. But what happens? The worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth, they choke the word. So basically what happens is this is a ministry that starts, and I go and I serve, I start my discipleship group, it grows, it becomes a compass, I'm doing well, I start that initiative, it starts getting recognition, I'm in the newspapers, people are seeing it, uh, everybody's celebrating, everybody's rejoicing, it's doing so well that I move my eyes away from Jesus and I move them to my provision. And this happens often, doesn't it? Yeah. Let me tell you, when your ministry is small and you are broke and they tell you pray at 4.30, you wake up and you pray because you know you need it. You know you need it. You're hungry for Jesus. You're hungry for breakthrough. That's what happens. But then let success start coming. Let the blessings, let the blessings, yeah, we see this as pastors, let the blessings come. And then you call and ask someone, but I didn't see you on Sunday. He says, you know, Sunday, I'm so tired. I have to walk my dog. It's the time I go jogging, it's the time I go jogging in the park. I go jogging in Karura Forest. I go to the, you know, I have to go to the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you couldn't afford the gym, you were here in church. I was in the yoga class. <laughs> What? When I was broke, I was in church. I was depending on Jesus. But now they want to see me. There's a newspaper journalist waiting to write my article. Surely, I cannot be here. I need to be preparing and putting on makeup. Yeah. Pastor Milton, how do you expect me for prayer? I have an appointment with the governor. Yeah. Huh? I'm playing golf with the governor. Yeah. So that we can feed the poor children, huh? Am I talking to somebody in the house? <laughs> Success is dangerous for some Christians, by the way. <laughs> I'm frozen. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, sometimes the most merciful thing that God can do to some Christians is keep them broke. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I'm telling you this as a pastor who has seen it happen in my church, that I've laid hands, I have taught money, I've seen prosperity, and then I've seen a man walking away from his wife because she's no longer as interesting as all the women that he's finding out there. You guys are talking like you've never heard such stories. They happen. They happen. Yeah, Lamborghini. <laughs> she doesn't match your Lamborghini. Her, her style. She's not at the level. True story. I'm not making this up. I'm actually talking about situations I know that happened in this church. All my stories are true. Thank you. Yeah. So, 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 guys, it's not just persecution that brings down movements, that brings down leaders. Sometimes it's prosperity and success and the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth. The deceitfulness of wealth. And you know, if you don't understand that, my goodness, you're in trouble. 
we better not pray for you to, receive, to start a movement. Just stay where you are. At least you'll make it to heaven, you know. And that's not a bad thing. Perpendicularly, at least. <laughs> at least you'll be in heaven. Now, yeah, because you might succeed and then we don't find you in heaven. So maybe some of you, we should just lay hands and say, Lord, keep them there. Keep them there. But that's not your portion in Christ Jesus. It's not your portion. It's not the portion of anybody at Fearless in Jesus' name. There's a fourth soil. Somebody say fourth soil. This is where you belong in Jesus' name. Jesus said that there's a soil that produced a crop 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. So God put an investment and gets back much more than what he puts in. That's a soil that he's talking about as the last soil. He says these are the people who hear understand and produce a crop. 30-fold. God gave them 30, they gave back, I mean, He gave them one, they gave back 30 times. He gave them one, they gave back 60 times. He gave them one, they gave 100 times. I hear the 100 person at the back there. I hear you. Uh -huh. I hear you at the back. So this is a finishing well zone. Now, there's no judgment. God doesn't judge between the 30 and the 60 and 100. You notice that? He celebrates them all. You notice the parable of the talents. He says, well done, good and faithful servant to all of the ones who invest. Whether you came back with two, whether you came back with five, well done. It's exactly the same thing. Because it starts, he gives you what he gives you and you multiply it. Because God wants multiplication. And so some of you, you may crawl to the finish line, but you finished. Finishing is important. Finishing is important because we're talking about many people who did not finish. With Jesus' statistics, one out of four, one out of four finished well. So just count the four people next to you. Number one, two, three, four. One, two, three. <coughs> Those are sobering statistics. Those are sobering statistics. And you know what? When I look at ministers and ministries, famous ministries, those statistics are not very far off. They're not very far off. There are many ministries that go up with, in the lights. They are passionate in doing things. And you look back 10 years from now, 15 years from now, and they're a shadow of their former self. So this stuff we're talking about, it's real stuff, guys. It's real stuff. What will give you the staying power? You see, how you start is not how you finish. It's not how you finish. And right now, you need to understand that there are enemies that are determined to take you out. There are enemies. The, the devil knows you came for fear, by the way, <laughs> just in case you thought that you fooled him because of wearing that fearless sweatshirt. <laughs> he knows. He knows you're here. And he has people who are determined to strike the shepherd to scatter the sheep. He knows if he gets you young. By the way, it's biblical. He tried to do that with Jesus, didn't he? He, he, he tried to do that with Moses, didn't he? He knows if he gets you down, then it, he finishes the ministry before it starts. So you need to understand right now that you're on someone's hit list. There's someone who doesn't want you to leave this place and apply the things you learned. Jesus' temptations were like that, weren't they? It's like, my goodness, this is my son whom I love, in whom I'm well pleased. Boom! The devil's like, no, 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 no. This is going too far. And he shows up to tempt this man because he's like, this guy, what he's about to start could actually cause a lot of damage to my empire. And some of you, what you're about to start right now out of this room could cause a lot of damage. A lot of damage to the devil's empire. To the devil's empire. There's a lot of damage that you could cause. I mean, guys, I'm not joking. Like, your life could cause serious damage to the devil. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it will, in Jesus' name. It will. It will. He will, like, like demons will know your name. Paul, I know. But who are you? Jesus, I know, but who are you? Have you, heard, have you? have you heard that story? They will not say that about you. They will not say that about you. I remember I told you about Bishop Adeboe and how he talked about the fact that when I walk into a city, all demonic activity ceases. That's your portion in Jesus' name. Yeah. That's your portion in Jesus' name. The only way to guarantee the future of a movement is to ensure the character of the leader. 
That's the only way that you're going to guarantee it. That's the only way that that movement that God is starting and giving birth in you will finish. God's job is to give you that vision. Your job is to look after your character. Because it's on the, on the, on the basis of your character that the movement will grow. The thing that God is entrusting to you will grow. The basis of your character. Because unhealthy leaders raise unhealthy movements. You know, there are people who, <laughs> I said another time, but there are people who I always say, if you're going the wrong direction, if you're going far from God, the devil will hire the Uber for you. <laughs> and, and, and you know, it's interesting because sometimes you see ministries prospering and you think Jesus is behind it. And sometimes the devil is the one doing your social media strategy. He's the one that's attracting people because he knows there's a character flaw and he knows what I just need to do is wait for this guy to get high enough because strike the shepherd at that point, he will bring the ship down because he knows there are foundational issues this person has not worked on. So today I want to talk about 10 indicators of a healthy leader. The 10 indicators of a healthy leader. Are you ready? <laughs> so here's what I want you to do just, cause, just so that you don't make this about taking notes. I want you to do me a favor and just... Turn to your neighbor and tell them what you think one of, the health, one of those indicators will be. Like, what makes a healthy leader for you, a healthy kingdom leader? I want you to help me with this sermon. Like, just tell them one of the things you think Pastor M must say in this sermon. He must talk about this issue. This one is critical from your book, in your opinion. Just pick one. Just what do you think are the healthy characteristics? Just one that you think you must, I must cover. Yeah? That was a multiple choice, not an essay question. <laughs> Some people tell them, talk to your neighbor, they start all their stories. Just say what I told you to say, finish everything else. All right. No, don't discuss. Just tell them the one thing. Okay. Timothy, the book of Timothy has a list. The book of Titus has a list. The book of Psalms has a list. Uh, Psalms 15. Lord, who may ascend. And it talks about he who has clean hands. It, it has a whole list of things, of, of the, the list of qualities of the person who comes to God. These are diagnostic indicators of a healthy kingdom leader. And I just want to mention a few of them. Let me just say that no one will ask these questions of you as a leader. And especially as you start to grow in prominence. You are the one responsible for your character. Your discipler will help, but you know, you know better than me, that you can fool people if you want to. Ah, Kwanzaa, if you've been a Christian for long like me. You can preach a Holy Ghost-filled sermon and you're living in sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very possible. So, you're the one responsible to understand the state of your heart. And these are some indicator questions, symptoms that you need to be paying attention to because they could be an indicator of a dangerous illness that you're facing. And the first one is, do I prioritize time with God? How many people say time with God? Prayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Quite a few of you got that one. Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it's, I think that would be quoted by almost every preacher here, isn't it? Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed, where he prayed. You know, pastors, Christian leaders can be some of the most prayerless people, some of the most prayerless people. And I don't know why, I think it's because we have assurance of salvation, we've kind of seen God work, so it's almost like, you know, other guys who are not so close to God, they're like, hey, I need God. Like, what? Like, I need to pray. But I think for us as Christian leaders, it's almost like, but I prayed yesterday. And, and he has my list. And, and he has grace also. And so, and so we can find ourselves in a very prayerless uh, state. Pastor Abmo talked about that. The fact that your, your, the people around you, your disciples, your members, they think you pray a lot more than you actually pray. Uh, it's just the reality. I think people in Mavuno Church think I pray. Like, how many hours? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like it's laughable how many hours pe your people think you pray. 
It's laughable. <laughs> I'm even praying right now. The pastor pose, he must be praying. He must be praying in the spirit. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Never stop praying. Oh, God. I live in the prayer closet. After, after I kiss Pastor Carol goodnight, I go to the prayer closet. <laughs> what? It is a lie. It is a lie. <laughs> M for prayer. Let me tell you guys, it is, always, it is always a perception that people have that you pray, you as a disciple, that you pray a lot more than you do. And it's important that you actually establish a culture of prayer. I won't go into that because I've more taught us all about that. It's like you have to, and, and the speakers have emphasized it, isn't it? Almost every one of them has told us why. Jackie told us, I mean, she goes into the office, she sets up an altar. I hope you took that as a takeout. If nothing else, where you work, there should be an altar to the Most High God. Yeah. And, and read it up. If you don't know how to set up an altar, talk to your pastor, read it up, do some, figure out how to set up an altar in your office. Because that's how you take territory. When my neighbors, they see me walking around the whole time. They think that I walk around because I like walks. But I walk around in that space because I am there. I am taking territory. Yeah. I take territory in that place. And I wake up before the guy who wakes up at five to shout. And by the time he's shouting, by the way, power is gone. <laughs> it's been switched off. Yeah, it's been switched off. The stronger man. We are taught about the stronger man. Yeah, it's true. It's actually true. And God has put you in a place where you need to take territory as well. Your office, your neighborhood, your family, you take territory. The way my wife and I pray for our kids, we never beg. We've been given authority. We just call out those things, and we speak with authority. I say, Lord, because I'm their father, it is done in Jesus' name. They shall be ten times wiser than their classmates. It's done. It's biblical. It's in the, I just pray for them what's in the Bible. If it happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed, why should it happen not, not happen to them? Why was the story given? To entertain me? No. So I can take it and apply it. Yeah? So I speak those things out, and I call them out of my children because I have authority. So you understand the place you have authority and you apply it in that place. Yes. So you must establish a culture of prayer. But here's the thing that you also need to understand. The caution for ministers, for you guys, because you're all ministers. The caution for ministers is that it's easy to get to the place where your, your relationship with God, your prayer is functional prayer. And let me explain what functional prayer is. I spend time with God because I need His help. I, I, I call out to God all the time, but it's because the demons that are waiting to face me if I don't call out on God. I know them. I, I, am I talking to somebody here? Let, you know, I had a, I had a I, 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 this was a realization for me late in ministry. I took a sabbatical, and I took a six-month sabbatical. And it was the first time I hadn't done any ministry. There was nobody dying around me. Nobody's wife was leaving them, and they were calling me. Nobody was, you know, demon-possessed. There was nothing like that. It was just me, my wife on holiday. In fact, we went and visited Christian in Southern California. It was so amazing, you know? It's like, like nobody wants me to pray for them. It was so good. And you know, the crazy thing that happened is I found, like after a couple of days, I couldn't pray. Like I'd, I'd, I'd try to pray, and then I'd be like, what am I supposed to pray about? And then I realized, since I'd been a Christian, I'd always prayed crisis prayers. Guys, if you know my life, you'd understand why I wake up to pray. I have demons waiting for me when I wake up. By the way, it's, it's true. I wake up and they're just things. And you know what? The higher you go up in leadership, the, the more you know things. There are some things that only happen because of prayer. Uh, Pastor, Apmo was talking about Bishop Adeboy who has 50,000 churches. How do you lead 50,000 churches? That man prays five hours a day. It's just like there are things waiting for you. You just better be a prayer warrior. And then what happens when you don't have those things? I realized I didn't actually have a friendship with Jesus. It was transactional. I was like that friend who calls when I want something. Do you have friends like those? <laughs> like, like, like you see the phone ringing and you're like, ah, oh, man, I know. In fact, you, your text is like, what do you want? Yeah? 
Yeah, I'm in a meeting. I'm in a meeting. What do you want? And you know, those friends, they don't give you a warm feeling when they call, do they? It's, it's, you're like, my goodness, you're using me. And I realized I'd been using Jesus. And I remember talking to Pastor Kenton of Mariners. He's the one who really helped me understand what was going on because I was so confused. I'm like, I can't pray. I even told him, I can't pray. What's happening? And he told me, listen, I, I, I want you to stop praying. I said, huh? He said, what, what you're doing right now is, is you're just trying to do the thing you've been doing and do it harder, and you think that's what's going to help you work. So he gave me a little book, and it's called Jesus Calling. It's the most ridiculous devotional I've ever seen. Uh, when we were growing up, we were taught as Christians that devotionals are people who have chewed the word, and then they're regurgitating, and you're eating somebody's regurgitation. And I was taught, go into the word yourself. Eat it for yourself and chew it. So I don't use devotionals for that reason. I think I was spoiled for that. But, but he gave me a devotional, and it's not even any kind of devotional. It's not even like Chuck Swindle, like, or Bishop Adebwe, like has scripture, nini. It's, that, it's something like you turn the page, it says, Dear son, I love you so much, Jesus. <laughs> and then, it, then it says, John 3.16. That's the devotion. I'm like, What? Like, like, what is this? Like, this is baby food. It's not deep. And then this pastor, because he was my mentor, he told me, I want you to only do that for your devotional for the next month. And he says, just meditate on that word that Jesus gave you. Dear son, I love you, Jesus. So the first day, I, don't, I think I even wrote, then I just thought, okay, I'm still not praying, so let me just try. And you know what happened? I just began to get a new love for Jesus. I began to fall in love with Him. I began to understand that He saved me and that it's about Him. It was never about me. I began to realize He doesn't need me. He gives me the privilege of serving alongside Him, and it's a privilege. Like, He doesn't call me Pastor M. Shock on me. Like, like, <laughs> like I thought He calls me Pastor M. You know, you've arrived. No. Like, he's my father, he's my daddy, you know? And I tell you, I'm so grateful to Pastor because that, that thing changed my spiritual life. It, it, rea it made me realize, nowadays, by the way, I can take a prayer walk for an hour and not ask for anything. Just enjoy his presence. Just be with him. And, 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 and some of you, you need to actually begin to learn to enjoy the presence of Jesus. To actually be aside, put aside time just to be in presence. And just to say, dear Jesus, you love me, thank you. And just to spend an hour meditating on that thought, reading a scripture about that and just focus on that. Wow, it was such a good thing. So I, I schedule, I, I, nowadays I schedule times of solitude and listening. I schedule times of prayer. I wake up early and I fight all the demons. But after the demons are fought, I try and take a prayer walk for about an hour in the afternoon. And I just spend time with Jesus. And it's, cha it's changed my prayer life. It's changed my assurance of, of my ministry. It's changed my assurance of who I am in Him. Like I don't have to prove anything to anyone. Are you understanding what I'm saying? There's something beautiful that happens when you just allow yourself to be a son, a child. Like I couldn't say daddy those days. Like daddy. Like papa. Yeah, like God. You can see the demons coming. God, I need your help. Shh, forget that stuff. He's my Abba. He's my daddy, you know. Yeah. So, so, guys, I really believe that this thing of prioritizing time with God, it's been taught here over and over. If nothing else, take this out from fearless. Schedule it. Make the time for it. And by the way, you'd be so surprised. Things actually work more and better when you prepare to pray. It's a shock. It's a shock. Like you find that you'd have taken three hours to prepare a talk, and maybe you'd have prayed 15 minutes. Try praying for three hours and prepare, you'll be shocked at the difference. And I'm not saying anything against preparation, by the way, but there's just something beautiful when God comes and takes control. Yeah. That's why this fearless is the way this fearless is. Hey, if you, knew, if you know Mavuno and how fearlesses have been over the time, huh? Schedule, schedule, schedule. The Holy Spirit is moving. Hey, Holy Spirit, it's over time. Let's, <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> Do I prioritize time with? That's the first one. Number two, do I have a healthy rhythm of work and Sabbath? Do I have a healthy rhythm of work and Sabbath? 
Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest, the same word, for your souls. For my burden, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My burden is light. Are you keeping the Sabbath? Have I frozen? <laughs> my network is unstable. <laughs> you know, if Satan can't get you to sin, he'll keep you busy. If Satan can't get you to sin, he will keep you busy. Because he knows that, you know what? You start replacing a position and you start forgetting there's only one savior in the world and his name is not Moravi. Substitute your name. Put your name in there. His name is not you. There's only one savior. And you know, busyness just gets you going and you start to think everything's depending on you. And, and the worst offenders of the Sabbath are ministers of the gospel. Yeah, we're the ones who offend it. We're the ones who don't keep the Sabbath. We kind of feel like we have to save people. We have to keep moving. We have to keep doing. I mean, how can the Lord bless you for your disobedience? <laughs> it's a command. It's one of the ten right alongside with idolatry and adultery. It is. And yet it's the one that we sort of think is the nine commandments and the one suggestion, isn't it? It's like the one, the one I kind of think when I want to obey. Um, and you know, the problem for most of us is we're addicted to adrenaline. And that's what we're addicted to. There's this chemical that your body produces uh, that just makes you want to keep running keep doing, keep moving. It's a fight and flee. It was given as a gift from God, but many of us have become abusers of adrenaline. And it's like we, we, we just have to keep going to feel like we're, we're, we're worthwhile. We have to keep going to feel like, we're, 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 like, like we have value. And you know, you go to interviews and you ask people a question. You know that question of what, what, what's one weakness that you have? Have you ever been asked that question? And, and you know the standard answer is, man, I sometimes work too hard. Because <laughs> you know they're going to hire you because you said that, isn't it? It's like everybody wants to hire a workaholic. Like I push my teammates too hard sometimes, but you know, I'm trying to learn. <laughs> wow. You know, the problem is that adrenaline can many times feel like the Holy Spirit. It's easy to confuse the two. Just that sense of aliveness awakeness, effectiveness. It can feel like the Holy Spirit is the one that's driving your ministry, but it's not. It's adrenaline. And you know, COVID-19 is the thing that helped many, many pastors begin to understand the danger of this. Many pastors crashed. When they found they could no longer minister to their congregations, they could no longer preach, they had to stay home and talk in a normal tone. <laughs> And, and, and nobody's listening to you and coming to your service. My goodness, people were, pastors went into depression. No views. No likes. There was a study by Barna that said, uh, which is a big uh, survey uh, company in the U.S., they said that 38% of American clergy considered quitting ministry in 2021. That's 40%, like, one, like four out of ten. Like depression was real. And this was one of the reasons that we're just addicted. We're addicted to doing. We're addicted to doing. You know, God made Elijah withdraw after his biggest ministry assignment because he realized his prophet was addicted to adrenaline. And you know what happens when you're addicted to adrenaline? You blow out. And this man, after seeing, boom, like the fire of God come, I mean, like the prophets of Baal and Asherah are destroyed. I mean, he should have been on the height. But guess what happens? He crushes. And the next thing, a, a, a queen, a woman uh, who, who is a, 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 who, whose prophets he has just destroyed, 850 of them, 
says, I will kill you by tomorrow. And the man panics and runs. Like, how do you move from being this conquering leader to somebody who's panicking and running from the enemy? That's the danger of living on adrenaline and not the Holy Spirit. So here's the thing. Give yourself permission to rest. Yeah? Give yourself permission to rest. Um, at Mavuno, I challenge my pastors to take at least two retreats every year and just go and spend time. I take three every year. Uh, two, night, two days, three nights. Uh, three nights, two days. And I just go by myself, Bible, notebook, pen, and maybe my guitar. And I don't carry a phone. I don't, I don't, have, I don't want my gadget. I just want to spend time with Jesus. And that's, part of, that's my rhythm. That's my annual rhythm. What's your annual rhythm? Like how, do you, do you, how often do you withdraw? How, do you have a schedule where you withdraw? And what's your weekly rhythm? Do you have a time in the week when you have spent, set time for just some extended prayer? Just some time when you spend time with God, a little longer than the usual? What's your weekly rhythm? And then what's your daily rhythm? How do you structure your day so that it starts with God and ends with God? Are you putting that healthy rhythm? And then are you taking rest? Do you take a break? Do you make sure that you take a break? When our kids were young, we took, we structured our leave, so we took it three times a year. And we just made sure every holiday we spent time with the kids. We took a cheap vacation, at least a week. And we'd go to a little house, a cabin, and just be with them. Just be. And it's just the rhythm of rest. You know, sometimes you feel like, I can't go. People are dying. Souls are perishing. <laughs> the gates of hell are... They are Tell your, tell your neighbor, God can do it without you. Yeah. But it's a best realization. It's a, it's a best thing you'll ever realize. That God can actually do it without you. I remember one time, this is going to help the parents. One, one time we were so stressed about one of our kids. And the things we're seeing, and as parents, any parents here with teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. There are times you just find yourself stressed by your children. And I remember as we prayed, God gave my wife a, a word that was so helpful because he said to her, I'm her father. Give her back to me. And you know, it was the best thing he could have ever said to us because we stopped stressing. We're like, Lord, she's your daughter. Take her. This one is your son. Take him. And we stopped stressing about it. We relaxed and just enjoyed God. There's a rest that God wants for his people. He wants us to enter into rest. You know, Jesus is our good shepherd. The sheep know my voice and they follow. That's how the shepherd lives. If, you, if, if people look at your life, will they know you're following the good shepherd? Because in Africa, we don't have shepherds like that. Huh? That was Palestine where the shepherd calls and the sheep follow. I don't even think we know what that looks like. You're just walking and sheep are following you. Ours is... Psst, well, psst, psst, well. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a shepherd, that's a goat herd. And some of us, looking at your ministry, looking at you, people would know you follow the bad goat herd. That's the, that's the evidence of your life. And the, the evidence is stress, ulcers, headaches, insomnia, bad relationships in your family. Hypertension, panic attacks. <laughs> you know, my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures, if you stay around me long enough, you'll always hear me quote Proverbs 10.22. And this is a scripture that I believe is true for my life, and I've claimed it for my life. And it says, the blessing of the Lord, it makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow. He adds no sorrow. But you know what? I'm not a hustler. And I'll never be. Hustling is not of God. And many times what happens as Christians, we're so hustling because we don't, it's like if I don't work so hard, my kids might not eat. If I don't work so hard, my ministry might not grow. But you know what? God wants you to work hard at the time you're meant to work hard. And then the rest of the time, He wants you to rest. Like what, a, what an amazing God that is. That he actually wants you to rest so much, he makes it a command. 
And what foolish people we are, that the one command that is supposed to be for us is the one we destroy and we, we disobey all the time. Like, how foolish is that? Ask your neighbor, how foolish is that? Like, these foolish human beings. These foolish human beings. So, so, so ask yourself those questions, your rhythms. What's your rhythm of rest? Do you get rest? How many hours do you sleep? Because some of you, by the way, you live here, you go, you go continue with your binge series that you're watching. And you're washed out because you're young. You think that, you know, you're, you're burning the candle on both ends. And you don't realize that whatever decisions you're making today will show up on your face when you're 50. Yeah, they will. You know, many people, many people when they're young, many ministers when they're young, they don't know this. I'm, I'm in my 50s now. And I can tell you, the people, yeah, I am. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know, I look 20. <laughs> but, but listen, I have friends who are in their 50s, and every bad decision they made in the past shows on their faces today. And when you're in your 50s, you can't hide it anymore. Like when you're in your 30s, you can eat fries and coke every day and have a six-pack. Well, let's say 20s, 20s, 20s. It, it's true, isn't it? Actually, do you know, like when, you're in, like when you were 16 in college, everybody had a six-pack, and even the ones who used to binge eat fries every day. But you know, at about 20, things start changing. By about 30, they're shifting. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a merger. It becomes, it comes, things start pulling together. And then you know what happens? At about 30, you can still hide it if you wear the right clothes. Then you start getting into your 40s, and it starts peeping out. Even the shades are not quite hiding it, but it's still, you can, if you dress really well in your 40s, people might not see. But let me tell you guys, you will get to your 50s where it doesn't matter what you wear. You'll be pressed down, shaken together, and you'll be running over. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a lie it's true I remember I showed I mean and, and I say this charitably I say this with all with all there are things you need to say because you need to teach your people isn't it even though you don't want to say something that sounds disrespectful but I remember we had a time when uh, my alumni group the guys we went to high school we all send our, it's like one guy said, look, we don't even remember, I don't even remember how half the group looks like. Let's all send our photo to the group so we can see. What? Here's what happened. Like, like, like I showed my kids, I said, these are my classmates. And honestly, they fell down laughing. Like, exactly. It's like, are these the teachers? Are these the... Like, like, listen to me. The decisions you're making today, they will show. And so don't feel like I'm 20, I don't need to rest. Because every decision you're making today, it will show in your life in your 50s. Okay, can I move on? Thank you. Number three, am I fully surrendered to the Lord? Am I fully surrendered to the Lord? Galatians 2.20 I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I now live in the body. The life I now live, I live in the, uh, in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. You know what? You're a servant of the Most High God. That is actually, that and being a son of the Most High God, those are your only titles in life that matter. Everything else is just a tool to help you with those two roles. Everything else. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. You know, today we almost don't need the Holy Spirit anymore. We have all the tools and the technology and the strategies and all the big things that can help our churches grow and our movements grow. We can read all the books on leadership when we want to pick them up. I mean, there's, there's just a way that nowadays, if you're anointed enough, you can make a ministry grow without the Holy Spirit. 
And, and it's easy to, for, for the Holy Spirit to have left the building a long time ago, and you don't even know that. It's very easy for that to happen. You know, many Christian conferences, they teach us techniques of ministry, the techniques of ministry. But you know, there's a place where it goes beyond technique. It's really a matter of your heart. Where is your heart with the Lord right now? Are you living for yourself? Are you living for Him? And this one, only you can answer for yourself. This is His ministry. I think it's one of the speakers who said that. I think it was Abmo who said it. It's not my car. It's not my wife. It's not my family. I think it was Bishop Masika who said it. It's not, it's not my career. It's not my ministry. It's not my church. It is His. Everything is His. And I'm crucified in Him. I died. I no longer live. There's no me. What you're seeing is Christ in me. And that's what it's meant to be for every Christian. And you know, nobody taught me this. When I got saved, I thought getting saved was fire insurance. You know, it's like my ticket out of hell. That's, and many of you got saved for that reason, isn't it? Somebody came and preached a, a scary sermon. Or you watched a fiery play. Any Kenyans who watched a fiery play? Uh -huh. you, know, you know the play I'm talking about. And, and, and you gave your life to Christ so quickly because you're afraid. It's like, this is how I get safe. But you didn't realize. You thought, you know what, now I just need to do a God thing, but then I can do my thing when I do God's thing. And you didn't realize what you actually were doing was signing over the deed of ownership of your life. You don't exist anymore. Somebody else owns you. And there's no decision that's your decision anymore. I mean, that's a fine print of accepting Jesus. They didn't tell you that, did they? That's a fine print. You don't have a career. I hear Christians saying, you know, my career, I'm really... What, what career? It's not yours. It's the Lord's. That business is not yours. It's the Lord's. I remember one of my, one of my professors in, in seminary. He was, he was an incredible guy. He was called, he was called Henry Nowen. He was uh, one of the smartest guys that you'll ever meet. Um, he was a professor at Fuller Seminary, uh, which is one of the preeminent seminaries in the world. But he was also a professor at, I think it was Harvard, at Harvard as well. And he was just this guy who was at the top of the academic game. I mean, he was so well-renowned. He loved Jesus with all his heart, but he was at the top of his game. And he writes a little book where he tells this story where Jesus asked him to resign from the academia and then told him, here's your next assignment. I want you to work in a home for children who have mental disability. Yeah? And I want you to work not representing them in TED Talks and conferences. I want you to work with them, loving them, caring for them. And you know what? Henry Nowen went there and he discovered, you know what, when you're people who have mental uh, uh, disability, the one thing they're not impressed with is how many degrees you have. Like all the things that had given him credibility in that world were nothing. The only thing that mattered to these kids is love. Like, how do you love me? And if you don't, there's no other story. And guess what happened? Henry didn't know this at the time, but this was his final assignment. He died doing that work. Now, some people would say, what a waste of a great intellect. Like, how, how could God do this? I mean, some of you are in that situation right now where you're staggered. You're thinking, what if God asked me to stop this thing that I'm really passionate about? But you know, Henry understood. It's not about me. It's all about him. Whatever he brings to me, I will take because it is his and I am his. And that's what surrender means. Have you reached a place of total surrender? Because if you haven't, God will give you a ministry and that ministry will become your idol. Yeah, it will become an idol and become the works of men. And there are many, many people running ministries that are the works of men because they're not surrendered. Guys, if God asks me today to leave Mavuno Church, I'll be the first one out of that door. I will. I know I say this, and I love Mavuno Church. I say I love this church with all my heart. But you know what? This church is not my identity. I am a son of the living God. And when my daddy calls me, I run. That's the most important thing, guys. It's the only important thing I run when my daddy calls me. I mean, my family, I love my family with all my heart. I love them. And they're the greatest thing God has ever given me, but God comes first. And I say it in front of you. He comes first. 
And I believe that as ministers, if you haven't made this decision of surrender, you need to make it today. You need to make it today. Where you say, Lord, everything that I am, everything that I have, everything I ever hope to be is yours. And that's what starts a ministry that can actually change the world. Am I fully surrendered to the Lord? Number four. Number four, do I have a healthy marriage and family life? Yeah. Do I have a healthy marriage and family life? By the way, I think with time, I'll probably get to number five today. I can see, I can, I can tell just from the way things are going. I can tell. M for teaching. M for teaching. <laughs> First Timothy 3, 2 to 5. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. I mean, those are really powerful things he's saying. Huh? If you apply them to the modern context and leadership today, you're like, wow. Not a love of money, not quarrels or not. <laughs> he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. So it's not, being about, it's not about you being a, a demagogue in your home and people fearing you. It's about your children obeying you because they respect you. And respect, it, it's earned. I mean, it's, it's, it's because of your time with them. It's because of them honoring you because they can see something in you worthy of honor. And he says, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? A really good indicator for lack of health is inability to manage a family. And your family could mean, for you who are not married, it could be just your relationship with your siblings. It could be the relationship with the friends that you have around you, your Christian family. For those of you who are married, it really does talk about your home. It was very interesting, Bishop Masika yesterday said, uh, no, uh, Dr. Wahome said one of the criteria that, that the, the small group would use to decide whether you should be an MCA or a leader is does your wife nominate you freely? Does your husband say this one can lead? Yeah? And, and I mean, it's, that's, that's a powerful nomination because it's like, does this person see what we see? Yeah? I, I, am I something different? I mean, you might find Pastor M wants to be MCA and Pastor Carol is like, kill this dude. <laughs> like, I know who that guy is, you know? I know who that guy is. You know, the first disciples are your family, your spouse, your children. Those are your first disciples. That's a place where you show whether you can disciple the church. Your kids liking church, your kids liking God. That's a huge indicator of your character. You know, it's interesting because too many Christians in the past have neglected their families because of ministry. And you show up, I, I, you know, it's like, it's like this person shows up, I, I suspect some of us might show up in heaven and say, God, I even destroyed my family for you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because that's one error, and I think we saw a lot of that. Uh, growing up, I mean, East African revival, one of the challenges in the East African revival is that many of us never follow the revival. It, it stopped in our parents' generation. They didn't know how to pass it on to us. They were so passionate about Jesus that they kind of just left us behind. Any East African revival kids know what I'm talking about. It's like they, they, they didn't, they didn't and, and, and maybe some of your parents did, but many of our parents didn't know how to pass it on. So, so they did it. But you know, there's also the other danger of the people who protect their family from ministry. Because that's another error that I see nowadays. It's like, I want to protect my kids so they never get hurt from ministry. That's an equal and opposite error. Mike Breen has a great concept that he talks about called family on mission. And he says that there are three kinds of families. There are those who are family or mission. There are Christians who are family or mission. And those ones are the Christians who are like, right now I can't do mission because my kids are young. Right now I can't plant that church. I can't serve Jesus because my kids are in college. I can't go where God wants me to go because my family needs me here. That's family or mission. Family or mission. And some of you may have been in that place where you've seen that error happening, creeping in. Family or mission. Listen, God gave you that family. He can take it away. Yeah. He didn't give it to you so that it becomes an idol. Because that's what happens when it's family or mission. It's like you're choosing your family instead of God. Or you're choosing God and then destroying your family. Both those are errors. It's not family or mission. Mike Breen also talks about family and mission. 
where people try to do all ministry and then they also try to do all family. So you see that they're struggling and they're dying and they're burning out. And it's like life without balance. Yeah, there's no balance. It's like they're dying and they're trying to be faithful, but they will die and they'll get to heaven and they'll say, <laughs> you know, Jesus said, it is finished. When they get to heaven, they'll say, I am finished. <laughs> so, <laughs> we smoke on you. Shh, I'm finished. That's not God's call for you either. And then Mike Breen talks about family on mission. Family on mission. And he talks about the fact that a family on mission moves as a park. It invites people into their lives, lives an integrated life that makes things fun and fruitful. And there's a beauty when a family is on mission because it means that, look, you know what? Our kids are young. Let's invite our friends. When you come to our house, don't expect our house to be tidy. Come in as friends. If you're part of our discipleship group, you come and even help us with those kids. We do work together. Let them even hear your testimonies when they're young because that's how our kids are going to grow. We're not protecting them from ministry, but neither are we making, you know, are we, are we now pulling the family apart in the process. We do life as a family. That's a healthy discipleship group does family on mission. It's like we share. When I'm going somewhere with my kids, I call my disciple, we walk together. When I'm going to the clinic to take my child to be treated, I call my disciple. We go and wait together. And discipleship happens as life is happening. That's family on mission. It's not choosing between the two. It's not trying to do both separately, but it's bringing those two together in an integrated way. And this is just a great way. I love how he teaches us how to manage family and still be fruitful in ministry. So how many nights a week are you home with your family before dusk, for those of you who are married? Yeah? Are you an absentee parent who's serving God? Are you one of those parents that kids will say, because of my parents, I never want to be in ministry? It's very possible if you don't understand that. So this whole thing about family, healthy family, marriage and family life, it doesn't start when you get married, it starts before you're married. And if you think right now, I can have, because I'm single, I can live an unbalanced and healthy life where I never see my brothers, I never visit my parents. Uh, and then when I get married, something will magically change. Shock on you. It's not going to happen. It starts now. All right, number five. Number five. I'm even thinking I should, which one I should do. There's so much here. Okay, am I a disciple maker? Am I a disciple maker? Yeah. Exodus 18, 17, Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. I love that father-in-law. He spoke it like it was. What you're doing is not good. It's like you're Moses, you're the hot shot, you're the best thing that ever happened in this world. You're like the leader of the masses. You're like the, like you're the, you're the thing, you're the shizel. But you know what? What you're doing is not good. Yeah. What you're doing is not good. Yeah. You're not, it's not good. I mean, that, there's no, it's, it's not like it's, it's not, it's like it's, it's okay, but no, uh -uh. it's like it's not good. In other words, it's bad. You know, movement leaders multiply themselves. They, 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 they serve others, they, they, they serve those they raise, they make them greater than themselves, and they pass on responsibility. It's a beautiful thing when you see it happening. A, ministry, a movement leader is not the end all and be all, but you'll always see leaders around them. If people walk around you, will they see leaders around you? People who look like you, people who think like you, people who are following you as you follow Jesus. Do you, have to, you don't have to be an expert in life at everything. And you know, I call it the curse of the gifted. The more gifted you are at doing things, the more you end up centralizing life around yourself. There are some of you, you can actually, you can do everything in your life. You're so competent. You're so competent. And by the way, I, I, I say this because I, I, I can easily run into this curse myself. Like, I'm that guy who's like, I can do most things, including bee farming. Like, I can do most things better than most people around me. Okay, that's a bad thing to say in church. But it's true, because I know I'm the one who knows what I want. So when I tell people to do things, they might not do them the way I want to do it. That flyer may not look exactly how I wanted it to look. That, that, that music may not come out the way I wanted it to come out. That, 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 that conversation, that Bible study may not be led the way I wanted. I, am I talking to somebody here? That report may not be written exactly with the, with the excellence I want to see in it. And so what happens to many of us is that you just find yourself shortening your day so that you can fit in all the things you need to do. 
And my wife taught me something very powerful because she's a master delegator. Anybody who's ever been around Pastor Carol, she is a master delegator. There's no task she's ever been given that she's never thought about. The first thought is, who else can do this task better than me? Like, I used to be so fascinated. It's like anything that you give Pastor Carol, the first question is, are there people around me who can do this better than me? And as a result, I just see her, I'm there working. And she just... And I'm sweating, I'm dying, I'm... And you know, the crazy thing is, we're both having results in our ministry. So I said, I better learn from her. I better learn from her. Some, you need to learn to be a delegator and a disciple maker. And you know something, the one thing I've come to understand, the things you don't like to do, you'll be shocked someone else likes to do them. Yeah. I mean, it's always a shock, isn't it? Like, I always think, I hate... I hate it. Some of you might say, I hate administration. I hate admin. So let me not bother other people with it. But there's somebody in your, in your, in your ministry, somebody around you in your circle who just lives and breathes. They're filled with the Holy Spirit when they see numbers. Like they just start speaking in tongues as they're just filling in numbers. They love it. That thing that exhausts you just gives them life. And so the first question you should ask is, who can do this better than me? Who else will enjoy doing this? I can equip them. I can help them come up to the standard and then release them to run with it. And you know what happens? As, as you're doing that, you're also growing them, isn't it? You're making disciples in the process. How are, the, how are you investing in the leaders around you? Do you have a leadership pipeline in place? Do you have disciples coming out, people who look like you can do the things that you do? Everything you touch should always have people around it who are left after you're gone. Every business you start should change the industry. Why? Because you leave 10, 5 people in that industry who will continue after you're out of it. That's how, that's how a kingdom leader thinks. That's how a movement leader thinks. Who am I raising? Who are the people that I'm passing this on to? And by equipping and training others to lead, you multiply your ministry and God's impact on your community. Because a movement, basically why God uses movements is because the mission is always too big for one person. It's always too big for one person. So right now, as you're going back to your office, to that NGO that you ran, to that initiative that you started, to that church that you're beginning, the discipleship group, who are your disciples? Who are your successors? Who are your apprentices? You need to, have very, you need to actually have names for everything that you're starting and to be able to say, this is the person I'm pouring into. As they follow me, they will become like me, and I will follow Christ. Am I a disciple maker? Ask your neighbor, am I a disciple maker? What did they say? Did they look like they agree with you? Did they, did they look, skept, did they look skeptical? <laughs> Number six. Number six. Do I keep healthy boundaries and accountability? Do I keep healthy boundaries and accountability? First Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, this talks about clear lines of accountability. People above you, peers around you, followers that have access to speak into your life. Do people feel like they have access, that they can speak, they can correct, they can actually say something if they see something wrong? You know, a, a movement leader takes care to avoid evil, but also the appearance of evil. A movement leader is somebody who apologizes when they're wrong. When they see that they're wrong, they're able to say, I'm sorry. Who is it who corrects you? Do you I mean, are you, are you the person who's who apologizes. By the way, I've apologized to my kids. Huh? I've apologized to my staff team. I think I'm, I, I've really apologized a lot. Huh? I've, apologized with, I've apologized with tears to my staff team. I've cried in front of them and said, guys, I'm so sorry. I was so wrong. In fact, they say I can do apologetics. <laughs> as I, have a PhD, I have a PhD in apologetics. I'm an apologizer. <laughs> But who is it who corrects you? Who is it who calls you out? Who, who is it in your life that actually has the courage to say, the way you spoke to your wife was not appropriate? Yeah? Who is it who tells you about how you bring up your kids? Your kids are a little on the wild side. <laughs> By the way, if you have any friend who can tell you that, then you're really accountable. Because kids, you know, kids are that place where we don't go. It's like, don't go there. It's like the kids come, they burn up my house, and it's like, oh, your kids are little, oh man, they have so much energy. <laughs> yeah, <they're, laughs> those, those little angels of yours. 
and then I start inviting you to my house late at night when I know the little angels are asleep. Because <laughs> I dare not tell you, those little angels of yours are just badly behaved. Who is it who talks to you about such things? Like, there are friends who can actually talk to you. Um, yeah, who corrects you on your character? It, it shouldn't be your husband or wife, by the way. Eh? I hope you're not inserting that. Yeah. This, this one is important. I think we need, to, we need to create, and like I said, it happens at all levels. It happens with, I need to have people above me who can call me out. I need to have peers around me who can say, we started with you before you are a bishop. And, and when you really loved God and something has changed. You need to have access. People need to have access. And then the people under you, who are the people who mostly spend time with you, isn't it? And they need to be able to know that they have, their, they have the right to actually come up and say, please, with honor, but is there something going on here? We've noticed that you're angry all the time. We've noticed that you're not, you're not happy. What's happening? That they sh people, sh people who follow you should actually have the courage because you've enabled them to have the courage. That you're not just on a pedestal and they feel, you know, Pastor M is just, he's talking so badly nowadays. It must be spiritual warfare. I think, I think it's just spiritual warfare. I think he's just spending so much time fighting the devil. Like, pe people will make excuses for you, by the way, when you're their leader. So you need to be able to be at the place where you're vulnerable and open. Do I keep healthy boundaries? When you listen to those men of God that I talked about earlier, some of them were in those practices they were in for years. For years. And the crazy thing is there were people in their ministry who saw the cracks and did not have the courage to confront them. They didn't have the courage to confront them. You can see this leader is spending time texting somebody who's not his wife. But then you say, must be counseling. <laughs> it's shepherding. It's pastoring. <laughs> he's, he's, recite, he's sending scriptures to her. Yeah. Are you lying to yourself right now? You know, it's easy to lie to yourself, huh? But you need to be able to know that there are people that you can talk to who ask you those hard questions, who ask you those hard questions. Let me tell you guys, if those guys fell, I'm not immune to falling. I know that. I need to have people who can ask me those hard questions. Number seven, am I a person of character? Am I a person of character? Exodus 18, 21, select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Character means that I'm the same all around. That what you see here is what my kids see at home. That who I am here is who Carol knows me to be. The people closest to you, that they would agree with the picture that you portray when you're up on stage. That's what character means, that you're the same you know, it's interesting, uh, one, of my, one of my pastors was telling me about uh, uh, a man of God um, that, that someone in his congregation was telling him about. <laughs> um, and he just said how, how um, there were three, I, I, he, 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 this guy, this person was working actually in a reception uh, in a motel uh, somewhere. Uh, and, and so his pastor coming in with a strange woman and booking a room. And the pastor didn't recognize the person and, and was checking them in. And, 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 and <laughs> yeah. I mean, and they're booked in a room as man and wife with this woman. This is a story in this city. Yeah. And, and the guy was, I mean, the person was in shock and then just said, hi, pastor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's crazy because the man who taught me about character was Bill Hybels. And he taught me the definition of character, who you are when no one's looking. Are you understanding about self-deceit? Because he, he, he did not live the thing he taught me. And I say this with all humility, guys, because I know that it could be me that someone is talking about in the next 10 years and saying, this guy taught us about character. Not it's not my portion, I know. But I need to be wary and I need to be careful and I need to make decisions today that I will live a life of character and accountability. 
Number eight, am I self-disciplined? Remember, these are the things that will keep you from being a movement leader. Am I self-disciplined? 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might myself be disqualified. What he's really saying is, I mean, I think the King James Version says, I beat my body to make it my slave. Like he disciplines his body. He doesn't allow his, his passions to rule him. He doesn't allow his desires to rule him. That he avoids excesses. Excesses when it comes to entertainment. Excesses when it comes to to eating. Yeah? That you are self-controlled. And you know, there are some practices the Lord leads us into that He calls us into because it's how we beat our body and make it our slave. Fasting is one of the best ways to beat your body to make, make it your slave. Every time we've done a fast, we do a fast uh, three times a year, but the January one is 21 days. And we do, uh, at Mavuno, we do a liquid fast. And a liquid fast doesn't mean you take meat and you <laughs> blend it. I... I, even, I even teach my people what, what, what they should drink. They drink apple juice. Uh, I tell them that's what you can drink. And maybe cranberry juice. And that's what you drink for 21 days. And of course, there are people who tell you, what? Are you mad? Are you mad? We're living under grace. Yeah, we are living under grace. Yeah. That grace is killing you, my friend. <laughs> it's a reason you don't have discipline and control over your body. Every time we do the liquid fast, we, I get, like, the addictions that people are cured of, you cannot believe. People are cured of addictions to sugar. People are cured of addictions to coffee, addictions to even other things. Bodies are healed. People with long-term conditions find themselves all of a sudden healthy because there were things that they were consuming that were destroying them. But you know what we're doing? We're beating our bodies and making them our slaves. We're taking charge. And you know, as a, as a leader, you have to be self-disciplined. I know tomorrow that I've got this thing coming. I know to stop and go to bed and sleep early. I know that I, 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 I take charge of my eating because I know I'm eating too much and I know that my body at this point can't handle it. You know, when I was 20, I could eat anything I wanted. And some of you look at me in shock and you're like, what are you eating, pasta? I'm like, I am 53, my friend. It will, to, by, in, by next week, it will show what I'm eating at, at, at Fearless. <laughs> but that's not the reason. It's also because I want to run my race. I want to finish well. I want to preach the gospel in my 90s if God hasn't taken me home. I want to be able to go where the Lord sends me. I want to be vibrant and full of energy because the Lord gave it to me to look after. I can't say His Holy Spirit is what will give me strength. He's given me the body and I'm the steward. And that's what it means to be self-disciplined. Am I aware of myself and my surroundings? Am I able to say, this is not healthy for me? I'm not going to do this. One of the things I have always been keen on, I, I know myself. I know that I'm an addictive personality. I don't know if there are any people like that in the house. I'm the kind of person, if I really get into something, I will get into it. That's why I don't watch TV series. I'm that guy. By the way, if I start a series, I can't stop. <laughs> My wife knows, cliffhanger is not for me. Because I'll watch the next one, and I'll watch the next one, and I'll finish them the whole night. I'm that guy. So I just don't start. I don't, I don't do, I don't, I cut sugar because I know sugar is addictive. And you don't know how addictive sugar is until you, you quit sugar. It's the most addictive thing in the world. It's poison. I mean, I, these things, by the way, I don't do them because I want to look good. I do them because, I want to, because my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And he wants me to be full of energy. He wants me to be full of I go to the gym. My wife will tell you, we go to the gym and we work out. Not because I love doing pull-ups and, yeah, it's not because I love it, but because I know what it does for me when I'm responsible and I'm, and I'm self-disciplined. This is God's work and I'm God's servant. And I must not, I must, I, I want this work, I, I want this work to outlast me. I want to be here until God calls me home. Number nine, am I self-aware? Am I self-aware? Psalm 90.12 says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. A healthy leader knows their weakness and delegates. You know, it's interesting, when you're self-aware, you begin to understand the things that are this is a weakness. This is not about me. It's, you start to understand. I mean, there's one thing that Pastor Oscar told me as a young pastor. 
that was very humbling and it was very self-illuminating. You know, when you're a young pastor and you stand in front of people and you start preaching, people like you. Okay, let me put it nicely. People of the opposite sex like you. They do. They do. And he told me this. One day he came and told me this. I mean, I think he saw me, t- I was single. He saw me take out a girl one day and then take out a girl another day from the church. He told me a lot of things. I won't share everything he told me. That's another sermon. But one thing he told me is this. He told me, when you're in ministry, never think that people are falling in love with you because you're so handsome. He said, I'll tell you why they're falling in love with you. They're falling in love with you because they're broken. They've never seen a a man who teaches God's word and is gentle and humble because what they've seen with their fathers is the opposite. And so they are projecting something onto you from their brokenness. And he said to me, just in case you haven't got this, it wouldn't matter if you are the gym instructor or if you are their barber, their, their hairdresser. They would still have the same affection towards you. And so he said, get it out of your head that people like you because of how you look and be humble. In fact, he said, be, put boundaries around yourself, Moravi, because it's not about you. And when you see a pastor who's, taking, who's, who's sleeping with a member of the congregation, it's because he's not understood. I'm using my position to take advantage of a broken person. That was the best self-awareness I needed as a young guy, by the way. I was like, let me just have the Lord. The Lord will bring me a wife. Like, like honestly, you know, it's, it's so interesting because you can actually be in a space where you're actually taking advantage of people you don't know. You're not self-aware to understand how you're coming across. Are you self-aware in your ministry? Are you aware of the scope of your mission? Are you aware of what God called you to do? Because maybe you're trying to do things that are not even your job. And you're even resenting God because like Adam, you're like, this woman you gave me, I mean, he's doing work that's not his work. And he's angry at God for it. Um, you know, Jesus spent 80% of his time with his disciples. The crowds were calling, the crowds were calling, but Jesus was self-aware enough. He knew this is my mission. And my mission is to look after these ones you gave me. And when I'm done with these ones, I come home because they continue the mission. He understood the scope of his mission. So when people, when they tell him, let's go to the next town because, I mean, let, let, let's, people are calling back for you. He's like, no, 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 I'm done here. Let's go to the next town and preach. Because he knew the scope of his mission. He was self-aware. And he was able to say, I've completed the task you gave me. Yeah. Yeah? By the way, the world was still dying. People were still getting sick. People were still oppressed by demons. But Jesus was like, I've finished the task you gave me. Do you know the task God gave you? Are you running around trying to save everybody, doing things that are not your task? Because you're not self-aware. And then number 10, am I courageous? Am I fearless? That's a good one to end at Fearless Summit. Am I fearless? Second Timothy 1, 7 says, The Spirit God gives us does not make us timid, but it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. You know, courage in this case doesn't mean that you're chasing demons. It doesn't mean that you're, 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 you're this guy who's not afraid of anything. What it really means is, do you have the ability to say no to the things that are not your calling? Because people are going to bring you many things to do, huh? And especially as your ministry starts to succeed, people bring you things. Are you able to say no? Are you able to do what needs to be done even when it's unpleasant? Are you able to keep going even when discouragement comes? Are you courageous? Does your life, is your life based on principle or is it based on circumstance? That's what courage really means. Are there some certain principles that hold you, that you live by? And it doesn't matter who's watching. Remember uh, Joseph, uh, 15 years old, living in a different country, uh, seduced by the boss, the beautiful wife of his, his boss, and it's like nobody will ever know. But he's like, no, 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 no. The principle of my life is how could I do such a thing and dishonor the living God? He knows. He's like, I have a principle that doesn't change. Daniel, 15 years old, king's court, being given the king's food. Nobody will ever know it's him. And by the way, you're awed. This is a superpower of the world. And he's like, we can't do this and defile ourselves with the king's food. It's like he has principles that do not change. What are the principles that don't change that you live by? And that you know what? I know my principles. I know my values. These things I will hold on to. You know, these are the 10. And I, my idea was not to give you a perfect list, by the way. Huh? 
Uh, my idea was just to give you a suggested list. Here are some things you can start to use. And maybe as you discuss, you come up with your own list. Maybe there's something I left out. Maybe, maybe there's someone, something you say, okay, this one is not as important, but I've got another one that's more important. But here's the thing I want to challenge you as movement leaders who are going to be commissioned in a little while, is to say you need to understand that right now because of being at Fearless, right now because of the impartation you're going to receive at Fearless, you will live here as somebody who is on purpose, but you'll also live with a target on your back. You're on somebody's hit list. And that enemy does not want you to finish. But greater is he that is in you than he who's in the world. And by God's grace, you will finish. And the ministry and the movements that you're starting will, will succeed. And they will be told stories of in the next 20, 30 years, people will be saying, my children got saved because of the ministry of this person. That professors of history will come and talk about the things that God uses used to start in your generation. I believe this as I say it, by the way, that right now there are movements that will be started here that will be spoken about. And even if they don't speak about them on earth, they will speak about them in heaven. That everything that God is putting on your hearts, it is worth it. It is worth following Him. It's worth following Him. And you just need to understand that God is giving you a great responsibility. He's giving you a great responsibility. I think it's the Marvel movies that say, great power comes great responsibility. The Holy Spirit is going to be here this afternoon. There's going to be great power released in this house. But with great power comes great responsibility. I want to just uh, conclude in a very brief prayer. We're going to have lunch because time of impartation is in the afternoon, right? Yeah, Father, I just want to thank you so much for everything that you're doing at Fearless. Thank you for what you're doing. Lord, you're not done yet. I know there's still some things you need to do, some things you need to uproot, some things you need to plant. And this afternoon, we're looking forward to this afternoon. But Lord, even as we eat lunch, as we discuss, I pray, Lord, I pray, already begin to speak to your children. Begin to show them things that need to shift in their lives. Begin to show them. I, I pray for everyone here, there'll be one thing they'll take out of this talk. Just one area they've seen a flaw. One symptom they've seen that could be a symptom of illness. And I pray that, Lord, they will begin to work on that issue. They would make a resolution about that issue. And that, Lord, as they make that commitment, that, Lord, you would honor them. I am praying that, Lord, they will finish well. And, Father, Lord, even as we eat lunch, I pray that, Father God, you just give us an anticipation and expectation for what you're about to do in the next hour or so. Lord, we look forward to seeing you at work in our lives, releasing us to do great things, to expect great things from God, and to attempt great things for God. I bless you, God's people, in Jesus' name. Amen.